Hello everyone, and welcome back to We're All Mad Here, episode 119. I'm your host, Rachel. How many women waste their life away the prey of discontent, who might have practiced as physicians, regulated a farm, managed a shop, and stood erect, supported by their own industry, instead of hanging their heads, surcharged with the dew of sensibility? So asked Mary Wollstonecraft in the 1780s. Considered the first feminist, she dreamed of a world where women could live by their own rules and be respected for it. Mary was born in the East End of London on April 27, 1759. The second of seven children, her parents were Elizabeth Dixon and John Wollstonecraft. While her father made a comfortable living at all of the jobs he would hold, he was irresponsible with his money, investing most of it in speculative projects that ultimately went nowhere, as well as his love of alcohol. As a result, he was always in debt, and the Wollstonecraft family moved often to avoid debtors. As they moved around, John tried his hand at a lot of jobs. Handkerchief weaver, gentleman farmer, and real estate developer among them. Besides squandering lots of his money on alcohol, Mary's father was a violent drunk. He often beat his wife Elizabeth, and young Mary would sometimes lie in front of her parents' bedroom door to protect her mother from John. The rough home life made Mary's relationship with most of her siblings strained, but she was very maternal toward two of her younger sisters, Everina and Eliza. She looked after them into adulthood, and once even helped Eliza leave her own bad home situation. Eliza had just had a baby and was suffering from what would now be recognized as postpartum depression. Her husband was abusive, and Mary made arrangements for Eliza to leave her husband and the child and start a new life. It's the move of a supportive sister in any time period, but back then it was also illegal. The laws at the time were summarized thus. The husband and wife are one person in law. That is, the very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage, or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband. And while Eliza escaped one hard life, she was forced to go right into another. Since society looked down upon women who left their husbands, Eliza couldn't remarry and could barely scrape by earning her own living. Her life didn't really ever improve, unfortunately. Mary was always pretty open about her depression, at least with her friends. She had two best friends, Jane Arden and Fanny Blood. She met Jane when they were both 14, and in reading their letters, it's evident that teenagers have always been the same in every time period. In one letter written in their first year of friendship, quote, You're not answering my letter shows that you set little value on my friendship. If you had said to ask me, I should have gone to the play, but none of you seem to want my company. I once thought myself worthy of your friendship. I thank you for bringing me to a right sense of myself. I keep your letter as a memorial that you once loved me. Eventually, the two made up, and years later, Mary wrote from her job in Bath as a lady's maid, saying, quote, I hinted to you in my last letter that I had not been very happy. Indeed, I have been far otherwise. Pain and disappointment have constantly attended me. Though I talk so philosophically now, I must own, when under the pressure of afflictions, I did not think so rationally. My feelings were then too acute. As it is, my health is ruined, my spirits broken, and I have a constant pain in my side that is daily gaining ground on me. My head aches with holding it down. Both friends Jane and Fanny had good home lives, and Mary very much envied that. Mary credits Fanny with opening her mind. Two years Mary's senior, Mary was impressed by how progressive and smart her friend was. In order to escape her home life, Mary left her nuclear family in 1778 when she was 19, she got a job as a lady's maid for a widow, but she found it hard to get along with her employer, so when she got word that her mother was ill two years later, she went back home to tend to her mom. When Elizabeth died soon after, Mary asked to move in with Fanny Blood and her family. She wanted to finally experience what a loving family was like. She loved living with the Bloods, but discovered that, ironically, Fanny, whom she credited with teaching her about how capable women could be, was a very traditional and domestic woman in adulthood. But Fanny was still liberal enough to dream with Mary of opening a boarding house together and supporting one another financially and emotionally. Unfortunately, they couldn't come up with the money to get the idea started, and it fell by the wayside. What they did instead was start a school with Mary's sisters in North London. But while Mary could never see herself getting married, Fanny's desire for a traditional life got the better of her. Soon after the school opened, Fanny got married. 
Her health had always been shaky, so her new husband moved them to Portugal. Forever devoted to her friend, Mary decided to go with them and act as Fanny's nurse. She helped Fanny through her pregnancy, and but she died giving birth to her child. Devastated, Mary returned to London, only to find out that her school had when she and Fanny had left for Portugal. Needing to make money, she took a job as a governess in Ireland. She didn't get along with the mother, but enjoyed teaching her charges. One of the children, Margaret, said when she was older that Mary had, quote, freed my mind from all superstitions. Some sources say that Mary decided on her own to leave the family after just a year, but others claim that Mary had a mental breakdown and was dismissed. Whatever happened, Mary decided she no longer wanted to work for other people. She wanted to earn money with her writing. She wrote to her sister Everina that she was trying to be the first of a new genus, of writers and of women. Mary took a room in London in 1787, learned French and German, and translated texts into English. She established a friendship with Joseph Johnson, a successful publisher in the city, and he had her write for his periodical, The Analytical Review. Mary and Johnson would remain friends for the rest of Mary's life, with her telling him that he was the loving father and brother she never had. Johnson was acquainted with a lot of writers, philosophers, and politicians and revolutionaries. He'd regularly have dinners that brought these people together, and it was there that Mary met people like Thomas Paine and William Godwin. While Mary and William would end up getting married years later, they were not fans of one another when they first met. The night they were both at one of Johnson's dinners, there was a speaker William wanted to hear, but Mary wouldn't shut up. He found her very annoying, and Mary found him boring. Who Mary didn't find boring was Henry Fuseli, a Swiss painter and writer living in London. She wrote to a friend that she was, quote, enraptured by his genius, the grandeur of his soul, that quickness of comprehension, and lovely sympathy. Fusley was married, and Mary, wanting to be close to Fusley as much as she could, asked if she could live with Fusley and his wife, platonically. Mrs. Fusley was horrified by this suggestion, and soon after, Fusley cut off all contact with Mary. The rejection was no secret, and in order to escape the humiliation, Mary took a trip to France. At this point, quite a lot of her writing had been published. A novel, inspired by her friend Fanny's death, called Mary, a fiction, and a political pamphlet called Vindication of the Rights of Men. The latter piece made Mary famous overnight, with people comparing her to Thomas Paine and Joseph Priestley. Mary's visit to France was ill-timed, though. She had arrived in 1790, when the French Revolution had already begun. If she were your everyday citizen, she would have run into a few problems, but Mary was not your average expat. She was friends with troublemakers, and by 1793, the French government was suspicious of all foreigners. In order to reside in the country, expats had to endure public surveillance, get a residency permit, and submit six written statements describing their loyalty to France. On April 12th of that year, all foreigners were forbidden to leave France. Mary was trapped in a country that suspected her specifically of treachery, and had seized and beheaded several of her friends already. Something good did happen during all of this insanity, though. She met Gilbert Imlay, an American author and diplomat. Mary was very progressive and did not hold to the societal rules of no sex before marriage. And while she had written in her publication, The Rights of Women, that women shouldn't get attached to the men they have sex with, she fell in love hard with Imlay. She also enjoyed being a sexual creature and soon became pregnant. Because of Mary's position as a political expat, both France and Britain were growing suspicious of her. So to protect her, Imlay told the U.S. Embassy in Paris that he and Mary were married. This immediately gave her status as an American citizen. Mary gave birth to her daughter on May 14, 1794, naming her Frances after her departed friend Fanny. She adored her daughter and wrote to a friend, my little girl begins to suck so manfully, all in caps, that her father reckons saucily on her writing the second part of the rights of women. But baby Fanny presented a problem for Imlay. He had fallen in love with Mary, the independent progressive woman, and he found her new dedication as a mother and domestic woman unattractive. Eventually, he left her. Mary was heartbroken and desperate to get him back. 
he kept promising to come visit Mary and Fanny in France, but constantly found reasons not to. Some scholars look at Mary's pleading letters to Imlay as proof of another depressive episode, but others say that those sorts of letters would be produced by any new mother who had been abandoned by the man she loved. In August of 1794, Imlay left for London, saying he'd be back soon. Mary stayed in France because the British government was not her biggest fan. They were severely punishing those who had been radicals during the French Revolution, and Mary was sure she'd be jailed if she stepped on English soil. But the winter of 1794 was the coldest in nearly a century. The Seine froze over, stopping the transport of coal and food throughout France. Across the nation, people froze and starved to death, and Mary and the baby suffered along with the rest of France. Mary finally left France in April of 1795, listing herself as Mrs. Imlay on all of her travel documents, and even telling her sisters that she and Imlay were married so that their daughter wouldn't be seen as a bastard. She tracked down Imlay in London, and he told her to get lost. He wanted nothing to do with her. If Mary hadn't been driven into a depression by his abandoning her with the baby in France, this rejection certainly did it. She attempted suicide, probably with laudanum, but was discovered and saved by Imlay. Mary took his life-saving efforts as a good sign, and in an attempt to prove how worthy she was of him, she traveled to Scandinavia to pursue business for him. This was a dangerous journey, and in addition to a maid, Mary brought baby Fanny along. She wrote to Imlay throughout the trip, updating him not only on business, but her thoughts and feelings during the journey. Eventually, she would publish those letters in 1796. She was sure that when she returned from Scandinavia, Imlay would tell her that he was ready to live with her and raise Fanny together. But she was wrong. He rejected her again. And so Mary wrote a note, quote, Let my wrongs sleep with me. Soon, very soon, I shall be at peace. When you receive this, my burning head will be cold. I shall plunge into the Thames where there is the least chance of my being snatched from the death I seek. May you never know by experience what you have made me endure. Should your sensibility ever awake, remorse will find its way to your heart, and in the midst of business and sensual pleasure, I shall appear before you, the victim of your deviation and rectitude. She tried to keep her word. She left the note behind and wandered around in the London rain to make her clothes as heavy as possible. And then she did indeed jump into the River Thames, but someone saw her and saved her. Afterward, she said that she saw her attempt as, quote, deeply rational, writing, I have only to lament that when the bitterness of death was passed, I was inhumanely brought back to life and misery. My attempt was one of the calmest acts of reason. In this respect, I am only accountable to myself. After recovering from her second suicide attempt, Mary gradually returned to writing. She reconnected with Joseph Johnson and his group of friends, which included again meeting William Godwin. While Godwin had thought a few years prior that Mary talked too much, he had since read the letters she published from her Scandinavian trip. He wrote, If ever there was a book calculated to make a man in love with its author, this appears to be the book. She speaks of her sorrows and at the same time displays a genius which commands admiration. As it happens, letters written in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, published in 1796, was intended to make a man fall in love with its author. The intended man was Gilbert Imlay, but Mary, now in her 30s, found that she didn't mind that it had worked on William Godwin. The two started seeing each other, which included having sex, and Mary found herself pregnant again. But the situation this time around could not have been more different. Upon finding out that she was going to have his child, William immediately suggested that they get married so that their child would not be illegitimate. Mary was more than happy to marry William, though the marriage did cause some issues in their social circle. Mary had told everyone when she returned from France that she and Imlay were married. While people knew Imlay was out of the picture, they thought Mary was still married to him. The fact that she could then marry William, no divorce needed, caused many of the new couple's friends to break off contact with them. William also got a lot of criticism because, in his own writings, he had said that marriage should be abolished. Nevertheless, these two people, who had clearly stated that marriage was not for them, happily married one another. After the wedding, the couple rented two apartments, about 20 doors apart. William knew how much Mary valued her independence and wanted her to keep it. The two saw one another often, but also wrote each other constantly. By all accounts, their marriage was a happy one. 
On August 8th, 1787, just four months after the couple was married, Mary gave birth to their daughter, also named Mary. The delivery seemed to go well, but a few hours later, the doctor told William that, in fact, the placenta had broken during the delivery, and it had not all been removed. An attempt was made to retrieve the rest of it, but it wasn't successful, and Mary quickly developed an infection. After several days of intense pain, she died of the very thing we discussed in our last episode, childbed fever, aka septicemia. William wrote to a friend, I firmly believe there does not exist her equal in the world. I know we were formed to make each other happy. I have not the least expectation that I can ever know happiness again. Mary was buried in the old St. Pancras churchyard, with a tombstone bearing her name and the note, Author of a Vindication of the Rights of Women. William had hardly any time with his wife, so in order to keep her memory alive, not just for himself but for their daughter and his stepdaughter, whom he took care of as well, he worked on readying her memoirs for publication. William was sure everyone would want to learn all about Mary's impressive life in her own words. She'd done what few women of her time did, and he wanted to share that. Unfortunately, their publication had the opposite effect. Mary had done more than most women of her time, and that included affairs, premarital sex, and children born out of wedlock. The public was shocked, and posthumously, Mary was only linked with scandalous actions, not with her groundbreaking writing and adventures. For almost a hundred years after her death, the world saw Mary only as a harlot, not as a revolutionary. The turn of the century saw many authors using Mary as the inspiration for their villainous characters, written to teach their readers a lesson. One of these authors was Mary Hayes, who had been a good friend of Mary Wollstonecraft's, even nursing her at the end of her life. But other people, namely female writers in the 19th and 20th centuries, actually read Mary's work and recognized her genius. Jane Austen was a huge fan, positively alluding to Mary in most of her works. Other admirers included Elizabeth Barrett Browning, Virginia Woolf, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Lucretia Mott, Emma Goldman, and George Eliot. In 1929, Virginia Woolf described Mary as immortal. Quote, She is alive and active. She argues and experiments. We hear her voice and trace her influence even now among the living. Mary finally returned to the mainstream world favorably in the 1960s and 70s with the rise of second wave feminism, which reflected many of Mary's beliefs. Six major biographies of Mary were written in the 1970s alone. Since then, Mary has remained a minor celebrity in feminist circles. Author Caitlin Moran described herself in The New Yorker as half Wollstonecraft, and Nobel laureate Amartya Sen, an economist and philosopher, draws a lot of her inspiration from Mary. Of course, Mary also lived on through her family, especially through her daughter, Mary. Little Mary had her own struggles with depression and also grew up to be a writer, most notably of the thriller Frankenstein. Check in next episode for her story. Thanks for checking out this week's episode of We're All Mad Here. If you like what I'm doing, you can go to patreon.com slash allmadpodcast and donate as little as a dollar an episode to get access to early episodes and bonus episodes. Of course, with a lot of people losing their jobs during the coronavirus, I totally understand if you can't afford that. And if you just want to help me out for free, you can go to iTunes and leave a five-star review there. Uh, It super helps the podcast and helps people find the show. If you want to talk to me, you can find me on social media. I'm on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and there you can see pictures and quotes relating to each episode and also suggest subjects for episodes. Thanks for listening, and I'll see you guys in two weeks. Thank you.